going to be talking today about uh, Bitcoin resource or blockchain resource management. Uh, anyone in the back? You guys can hear me. We're good. Awesome. All right. So my name is Vikram. I'm a developer. Um, I also work in the bioinformatics lab right upstairs, and I do a lot of tech stuff. And this was our research uh, that got funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, doing some crazy stuff that I was actually surprised they funded us because it was kind of insane. So uh, the, the research focuses on decentralized resource management. So you know, on your kind of laptops and computers, if you have Windows, you see the whole uh, control, all, delete, you go to task manager, and you see resource management. We're trying to apply something like that to um, a much broader context where we can see what's going on with devices that are not connected to one another in the same physical place. Um, I'll talk about what the applications are, uh, but I do want to start off by uh, saying thanks to John and Jeff for like having me around. And uh, the i program, uh, the i actually kind of just very briefly teaches you how to commercialize research. So that just ended yesterday. That was like a good 10, 11 weeks of solid. That was, it was crazy. Uh, and obviously National Science Foundation and these sides for having me back here. So let's see. So here's how the talk is structured. Initially, uh, what is the blockchain and why do we need it? These are going to be sh short. I don't want to spend too much time on them. Uh, third one is the opportunities in blockchain. And that's not just opportunities for technology. That's opportunities for application and commercialization of technology. After that, I want to cover the big blockchain application stack. And finally, that was my contribution, the definitive logical access units. Um, I think I should kind of uh, make a point here about what I'm not going to cover. That's probably more productive because Bitcoin is way too broad. Um, I'm not going to cover mining. I can give a whole talk on mining, but I chose not to. Um, you know, mining is a very kind of exhaustive thing. And I'm not going to cover kind of the whole crypto political landscape of, at all. That gets very heated and unproductive. Uh, and finally, I'm not going to cover kind of the really technical aspects like in, in f when the fork happens, what goes on at that time, how do you pick the longest selecting chain? I'm not going to cover those topics because they are again very kind of technical. I mean, this kind of thing is going to get there too, but in kind of a different level. So, what do I want you guys to kind of take out of this? No, uh, that's kind of why I chose this track. No, so, there are kind of the three uh, main takeaways that I want people to get out of this. One, and probably one of the most important one, is that. Bitcoin may or may not be around 50, 60, 70 years down the line. Phil Levine, kind of the CEO of Evernote, he likes to say build companies that last 100 years. So can you build a product company that lasts that long? Bitcoin may or may not be around, but blockchain will definitely by far be around. Um, it's kind of Satoshi's legacy and what, what makes it so like, fascinating. We'll get into that in a quick moment. Um, the secondly, so in uh, early 1900s, there was a guy he broke into a, a bank. This was so next to me, right? He breaks in and like, and there's you know security guard and he gets gets arrested. So they ask like, you know, why did you break into a bank? He's like, oh, I'm just you know breaking in where the money is, right? So you go where the money is, and investors right now are looking really, really, really carefully. I mean, I'm talking about big firms like Anderson Horowitz who will throw like a couple of hundred thousand, like five, five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand in seed money to invest into Bitcoin and blockchain-based startups. And I'll talk about that environment in a moment. Kind of weird, you know, leaving that picture and talking about the importance of the talk and so on. Uh, so lastly, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is going to be the logical units. So um, if you guys know the uh, whole, you know, ISA, right, so which is instruction set architecture for the processors, the way they started off ages ago was those vacuum tubes itself. Um, in the vacuum tubes, one of the things they could do was very basic but definitive logical operations. So in, in a kind of going back to the roots of computing, I'm trying to, my research mostly focused on how can we do the same stuff that was done ages ago with vacuum tubes, bring it to the blockchain. All right, so let's get started. <coughs> so what is the, the blockchain? Um, as you guys already more or less know, um, Bitcoin has a public ledger. Uh, public ledger, public register, anything, uh, it's called a blockchain. Basically, it's a public record of all the transactions that are taking place over the time. Um, it does a few things very, very, very well, and one of those is uh, verification. So a lot of cryptographic schemes focus on the idea of being able to verify one, 
one thing works as another, right? So public and private keys in PGP, kind of follow that. Um, blockchain, it doesn't do PGP per se, but a lot of the kind of ideas per se still translate over, which is you have a lot of nodes that independently verify transactions. And that's one of the things that gives you a huge advantage in the blockchain over, so you can't do what's called double spending. And I'll get to that uh, shortly because I, that's a kind of a critical part of what I'm gonna talk about in a bit. Um, <coughs> blockchain itself really is nothing more than a recording tool. Um, and that's my angle of, you know, kind of my focus on research too. The little picture you see here kind of really, you know, illustrates what's going on. And blockchain is nothing more than blocks really uh, strung together in a sequential order. So one going to the next one, going to the next one, going to the one after. And they're done in a very nice manner so that you pick any block and I can verify up and back. I can verify, you know, which one, which transactions have happened. Um, and this has allowed, in, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain kind of stores everything. So you imagine it gets very, very, very big. And every computer that's accessing it needs to have all of it downloaded. So you're talking about almost gigabytes of data that builds up. But, um, you know, there's, a, a, especially in Bitcoin, there's other, um, they're called light wallets. So like Electrum, I think is the name, I'm kind of blanking on the name now, which is a light wallet. So it doesn't actually require the entire blockchain. It requires some N number of operations that you can do on the blocks and like that verifies it. Um, I'm a big believer in kind of on the original Unix philosophies that uh, came out very, very long time ago, 1990s, 1991. Uh, Red Hat made it very popular kind of. And the idea is that you make one tool that does one thing right, that's it. So if you're a kind of like on mailing lists and stuff, you're probably using an email client like Mutt. It does one thing and it allows you to read email, but my God, it's so extensive. There are so many options, so many things you can do with it. And, and it does something really, really well only because it stays true to that original philosophy, which is one tool at one time. Um, eventually, what you want to do is you want to string them together. So one tool does one thing right, you put it in another one, like proc mail, so filters, another one, which is a mail filter. And you've got a pretty nice mailing system that you can use with a lot of those kind of things. Um, going back to the blockchain, and I thought, try to think about can you give kind of one tool, one job right kind of functionality to the blockchain? It's difficult because blockchain does a lot of things. But like if you kind of go back, you know, if you strip away everything that's non-essential, the blockchain in the end gives you a tool to record. And that's kind of its core power of feature more than power that we exploit. <coughs> this takes us to kind of the core idea of uh, kind of my uh, research, which is I tried to find a way that could we use the blockchain to record events undisputably? And so the, the point is that if you have transactions, see, in the advantages, if there's money involved, people are gonna do that stuff right. Uh, you can just inherently kind of bank on that because if there's money involved, there's a lot of people who are capitalizing on it. As a result, people are gonna build tools that are more reliable. So we can use that, well, I can use that to my advantage, right? I can, I can kind of blindly rely on the blockchain to do one thing right. And that's undisputedly tell me which events are happening. And by event, I just mean a transaction. I'll make the more generalized assumptions later on. Um, I, I did mention I'm not going to talk about forking, but I'll very briefly mention something. Uh, so one thing that's really, really, really powerful about the blockchain is error correction. So when a transaction happens, the, the blockchain can kind of run through a lot of the unsorted entries and make sure, if I'm going through these entries, is any of them matching this one? If they are, it'll say, no, this has already been spent. So if I have 100 bucks and I spend them, and then before the transaction kind of gets verified, I spend them again, because you can't do that, and the blockchain will just say no. Like, you already spent your money, you're done, you're spending an extra 100, that's kind of the basic idea of the um, double spending problem. Uh, we call that error correction, and it's essentially error correction in the broader sense where it will allow you to kind of build applications on top of it, and that's kind of what we did. Um, it was kind of, the, I think part of the reason the NSF liked our idea uh, was just because we were doing something like this that hasn't kind of been done before. Um, so kind of going back to um, algorithms, data structures per se, uh, you can view the blockchain. If you go back to the, you know, what I just mentioned earlier, which is the core idea, one tool, one job, and here we have a recording tool. So you can kind of view this recording tool as a data structure. 
a very complicated one, but uh, still a data structure that can record things in a, in a way that you want. Once you have that kind of mindset, what you can do is you take the data structure and you can kind of build layers upon layers of uh, application and even access level applications on that. I asked the question that can you take transactions, which is what generally happens on the Bitcoin blockchain, can you generalize that to events? So transactions are kind of like events, but events would be more general. They're not limited to just money coding code. You can do other things with it. Now, I, I understand that, you know, Bitcoin 2.0 and all that kind of stuff. In color coins, you can already assign monetary value to things. But we're kind of talking about something more fundamental, which is, can I take any event? So, um, you know, being a security conference, I'll give an example of an event. Excuse me. Um, intrusion detection. So you have a lot of kind of events coming in. Can you look at that, those events, kind of record them, and filter out what's right and what's not right? So which ones you need to defend against, which ones you don't. Can the blockchain kind of do something like that? And now the blockchain is kind of inherently made for money, so to speak, but can you kind of still bring those ideas over? And I spent about a year roughly, um, give or take on, on this idea. So let me take a step back and talk about why do we need the blockchain? Why? Why is this even there? You know, why, why don't you just use PayPal and send internet money or something through email? Uh, if you look at Gmail now, it's got a little like dollar button at the bottom. You can just send money to each other. I haven't tried it. I don't know how effective it works or not. But you know, why not do that? One of the, the big things that came out as the blockchain was coming out was something called the three Byzantine problem. It's uh, the picture kind of shows there are three generals: general one, general four, two and three. Oh, there's four generals here. Um, so. One of those generals is a trader. The, the idea is, the, uh, in, in the kind of classical version, there's three, but here's just uh, an extra one. But there's a few generals who are going to attack a territory. The problem is you can't trust one of the generals because one of them is a trader. So he's going to send a corrupted message or a fake message to one of the generals, go attack, and the enemy's already prepared for his attack, and he's going to get crushed. So how can you still do the whole passing the message across from each other and remove the trust? That was kind of what's, what's so fundamentally important about, about Bitcoin. The reason Bitcoin is fundamentally different from currencies like you know, fiat is that there is no inherent need for trust. Satoshi inherently built the blockchain in a manner that like almost zero trust is required in the whole process because you can get public verification. So it, it solves the core problem in the, the, the Byzantine generals, which is it doesn't matter whoever sends what message. If the message is wrong, it's going to get checked. Um, because a lot of kind of public nodes are identifying which messages are wrong and they can kind of mix and match that. This was kind of probably one of the biggest um, problems. This has been an open problem for about 30, 40 years before Satoshi came around and put the tools together to solve it. That's kind of why this is his huge legacy. Going back to a little bit of the history and why. So, hashtash. This has been around actually, the original paper came out in 94 and then 96 when these were around. Um, Hash cash was used early on to kind of work with spam mail. Then came the idea of proof of work. That was also part of hash cash, which is also again for spam mail. Lastly, the Byzantine journals is with a very open known problem in distributed message passing. So these are like MP protocols where you pass messages from one process to another on a processor level, and a very you know, fundamental systems level. These tools are all been existing. So this is not something like completely, you know, kind of out of the blue and ordinary that came out. What Satoshi's this absolute genius was putting them in the right kind of order. Right? So now we have proof of work, proof of stake, even proof of bandwidth, which I'll talk about in the end. And they're all kind of really cool ideas. But initially they all had kind of been, the work for these ideas had been done around 94, 96, and then eventually 2001. Um, these were all, you know, very well known papers. Uh, so what makes um, Bitcoin, and particularly the blockchain, so exciting, at least for me, is, is kind of what I mentioned down there, which is the decentralized consensus. And that's the idea of having independent verifiable nodes which can connect and verify one event. Each of these nodes can, you know, there, there can be a million of these, there can be a million events, but these nodes can, obviously taking some time, verify all those events and match them up. So nothing in the registry stays unmatched, quote unquote. And this, you know, really allows for, uh, for, for something that wasn't possible before, which is transferring currency. Because the reason we need banks, well, there's a lot of reasons we need them, but the, one of the fundamental reasons we need them 
is because there needs to be a centralized authority that can dispute in case transactions go wrong. That's well very generalized, but it's one of the reasons we need them. The blockchain eliminates that where money can be transferred. It's not money really at this point, it's assets. So assets can be transferred from one entity to another without the need for a mediator who will also take part of the cut. It'll slow down the process, very, you know, m make it very sluggish. Um, the distributed computing that came out of this, which is the whole idea of Bitcoin 2.0, where you're not transferring money anymore, you're starting to transfer assets. And, and these assets, and I'll talk about what those assets kind of are, at least now, in like, you know, the 2.0 whole revolution idea. But that's a very, very powerful paradigm. Think about it, like 30 years ago, like 20 years ago, you could not ever think about transferring money from one place to another, kind of have it done in, you know, five minutes. What is it, the transaction verification time is about five minutes, right? Five, ten, maybe? Yeah. So, it, in, you know, you couldn't have it done around in, in that time period, um, especially it being verified and made available. So uh, the, the, the example I kind of read when I was just learning about Bitcoin, uh, this is, by the way, when I had already missed the Bitcoin shit. I, I initially learned, uh, my friend told me, I was like, this is never going to work, I'm not going to buy this. That was when like, I got a thousand or what, 500 Bitcoins for 10 bucks or something, uh, super cheap, and uh, I regret that. I would probably be a millionaire right now. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, so that's when I started learning about this, and one of my friends told me, like, you know, think about it, if there's a, can I, you know, some remote village in Africa just has internet access, they have like a, an ATM for Bitcoin. They're kind of common now in, in Canada from what I've heard. But you can transfer money like kind of almost instantaneously. Like five, ten minutes, the other person in like kind of a remote place has that money. Um, taking a step further when you can transfer assets, now you're talking about a kind of a very powerful paradigm shift. And I'll talk about why that you know gets all, gets us excited. Um, kind of going to the taking a step further, um, the blockchain allows for something um, called an uh, interfacing hub. So start to think about the blockchain as, um, as kind of an entity to which multiple devices connect, right? So, so you have a kind of a thing that sits somewhere virtually and millions of devices interface. And, and keep in mind, this is not limited to just computers. I can connect to in a blockchain transfer money from my laptop. I can do it from my phone. Um, that was probably one of the best things. Um, you can transfer money right off your phone to the blockchain. So millions of these devices are connecting and the blockchain kind of evolves from the core idea of just being a way to transfer money to a way to interface devices. It's inherently very, very tough. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the room kind of make a living doing this, is connecting like kind of the features I have on my desktop at home to this laptop and then onto this device. It's inherently tough doing that, right? So blanking on the name of the application is AirDroid. You can transfer stuff off your Mac into the Android phone pretty easily. Anybody? Yes? Okay. So, uh, blockchain is kind of moving in that direction now, where you can actually really use the, the features were, again, already built into the blockchain, right? So, I'm not making a new thing to connect my laptop to the blockchain or connect my wallet to the blockchain. The libraries allow the interfaces. The, what has not been done is kind of take it to the next level where it's, okay, well, can we take the interfacing and take advantage of it? If the devices are connected, can we kind of push? So you know, it's one way, right? So devices to blockchain. Can we kind of go the reverse now? If we could do that, then you know, we're looking at something quite powerful. Um, seamless integration has kind of been a huge deal lately, uh, especially with the buzzwords of Internet of Things. You hear that everywhere. Uh, millions and millions of dollars have been poured in by companies like IBM and so on. Um, what, what is coming out of it, we don't know too, too well just yet. So the whole kind of funding cycle takes about eight to 10 years. So a 10 year report card you can evaluate, all the money that went into IoT, um, big data, which is another huge buzzword. Um, in 10 years you can evaluate how well they performed with all the money that went in. You know, last time that happened, which was, was called clean tech, whole bunch of venture capital money went in, nothing came out, huge disaster. Uh, but we hope that doesn't happen here. Uh, because that'll probably cost a lot of jobs. <coughs> oh, yeah, so um, mobile wallets have been kind of a, a big deal. So like uh, Bitcoin has one, I think a couple of other alt, alt uh, coins also have mobile wallets. Uh, mobile wallets are kind of the first step of kind of taking it a step further where you can do the whole seamless integration. Uh, so 
very briefly, and I'll come back to this, my research focused on how to create an enterprise level cloud for a blockchain that an organization can use amongst themselves to create the whole internet of things. So we're relying on just deploying kind of a cloud container with a blockchain that you can interface back and forth for a lot of devices. So um, moving on from here, I'm gonna kind of take a, a short detour of why do we really, you know, really care and we're really excited about Bitcoin. Um, this is a brief kind of graph, hopefully you guys can see, of um, the virtual capital money that's going in. So around quarter four of 2014, about 45 million went in and only 15 deals. So that means venture cap, venture capitalists, and some of the biggest ones in Silicon Valley, made about 14 deals and totaled 40 million. And you can just, just divide that and just think about how much one each deal got. That was a huge sum of money that they got. Coindesk, one of the probably best like sources of Bitcoin news and stuff, they got a huge chunk of money from Andrews and Horowitz. They're actually one of the investors very, very interested in this. So going back to the idea of the guy who like broke into your bank, go where the money is. This is kind of where the money is right now. Um, so another thing that kind of makes it more exciting in the whole Bitcoin 2.0 is this service, storage.io, which came out. Basically, this is going to become a Netflix. Um, you can pay using cryptocurrencies and kind of take, basically stream data um, off of kind of the decentralized storage, which is blockchain. So your assets can be stored elsewhere and you don't kind of need, uh, so if, if you kind of, for instance, walk into uh, your, your office or something, you know, a huge building or something, and you kind of have like a storage kind of internal cloud where you can walk in and if you have a message, you just pull out your phone and like it'll stream right off for you. Like you kind of have like a message or something in a video or you have documents. Basically it's like a file storage service, but it also allows music streaming, videos and all that. And it does everything through kind of the, uh, the blockchain idea. And I'll talk about why do you need to do this with blockchain? Why not just use Google Drive or something? Right? So what kind of gives us the advantage? One of the basic reasons you can do that is because it allows for smart contracts. And that's been a huge, huge deal that we took an advantage of as well. Smart contracts basically allow you to do, to kind of automate a task. So if you use a, an application called If This Then That, uh, it's kind of the same idea. You have a smart contract that executes at one time doing one thing. Uh, here are the, some of the assets I was talking about earlier on. Uh, one is obviously stocks, right? So a lot of kind of uh, companies are starting off, it may or may not be a bad tactic, but they're kind of starting off with an idea. So Ethereum, um, huge, you know, made strides in this direction where they started off selling a couple of million worth of Ethereum coins. And, and you know, obviously they're doing some really amazing things. Um, so like kudos to them. But a lot of companies are starting off, one is, you know, stocks. Obviously currencies is, um, is one of them. And lastly, it's the whole idea of smart property. Um, Imagine you know, going to rent a car and like you kind of just take your phone out and put it next to the car. And the car's got some sort of Bitcoin blockchain access that it can verify that you transferred money automatically. Your smart contract stopped for eight hours. You get in the car, drive, whatever. You don't have to go see a, a person to pay them, fill all the paperwork out, because that's already been taken care of and matched. And after eight hours, your smart contract expires. You get a message saying, it's expired, go return the car in the next hour, or you're gonna get fined and thousand dollars. I don't know, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, another thing that's been interesting, especially that I've talked about Ethereum, um, is these uh, development grants. Uh, I encourage people who are like kind of Bitcoin developers and who are interested, particularly in the whole like startup ideas and stuff, come see me kind of afterwards. There's a few things that are coming up at UCF. So if you're here, let's kind of talk after the thing and um, I can get you guys hooked up with some of this. Development grants basically offering money to developers from one to 10,000, I think is the kind of the upper limit. Uh, groups of two or three people who can apply if they have good ideas and kind of, you know, good technical background, apply to get grants. Um, that we got a grant from the NSF, not from Ethereum, but same idea. You, know, you get some money. The NSF gave, gave me some money to kind of go through one semester and, you know, spend all my time doing that, doing the kind of research. So these are just popping up. Um, Google had one like this too that I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a quick moment. Uh, Ethereum is doing something quite interesting that I want to talk about. So this is something Satoshi had considered if you look in the email archives, but Ethereum is really trying to make something that was previously really thought impossible. They're trying to make what's called Turing completeness live in the blockchain. So 
what happens is, is the way products, uh, especially decentralized products get designed, is you have the base, kind of a core, and on top of it you build it. You want to leave the core kind of strip minimal. And that was Satoshi's philosophy too, like keep the blockchain as minimal as possible. Uh, going back to the whole Unix philosophy, the reason is it'll work very well. With Telwak, who's kind of the core developer for Ethereum, um, actually went kind of against that traditional thinking. He's like, no, I'm going to incorporate like pure and completeness. And what that basically means is you have logical access to the blockchain. So you can actually create a program, like a script, that runs whatever you mentioned in the script on the blockchain. So using the blocks, the transactions, and the transaction entities as a function, can you create a script that integrates those in a meaningful way to do something? And that's the whole idea of smart contracts, where you can integrate blocks, you can integrate transactions, uh, place of origin, all those kind of things, and create a, like a really cool smart contract that uniquely identifies you as the person pushing the contract or fulfilling the contract and then getting a service as a result of it. A really, really cool idea. The reason Satoshi didn't consider it was because this would let scripts run everywhere. And those of you who've done server security, you know how bad that, like when if a script gets, gets in and does something that you don't want it to do, I mean, you're looking at like a lot of crap you've got to clean up afterwards. Satoshi initially did not want to even touch this topic simply because he thought it, the blockchain would get too bloated, and more importantly, the blockchain would have too many issues. It would get sluggish, it would get, you know, not just sluggish, the security issues come up, which are huge. The blockchain does a really good job. It's actually more secure than HIPAA, which is the compliance for like medical records, which is kind of awesome. And this is open source, and HIPAA requires you to pay thousands of bucks. I don't know, it, 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 huge, you know, kind of, kind of overhead on cost. Um, but this will actually open up kind of a whole Pandora's box that you don't necessarily want. Because scripts running everywhere, running wild is like definitely no, no. Uh, these are two kind of other uh, opportunities that really came up soon. Swarm started what was absolutely incredible, which is crowd equity. Uh, so companies that are raising money do something where they give out part of their company. So in the hope that their company will be worth millions of dollars, they say to an investor, here, take 10% of our company and give us a whole bunch of money so we can like start building this company, right? Swarm actually allowed people to do that through cryptocurrencies. So on Kickstarter, when you, you give someone money, all you get is like a stupid toy or ball in return. Now you're actually getting a stake in the company. So if a company becomes a multi-billion dollar company one day, you're gonna be probably set for life if you invest it in that time. Uh, interestingly, if you follow the uh, kind of White House landscape and what's going on there, the Jobs Act that got passed in 2012 is going to allow people to do that um, with fiat. And we are like incredibly excited because I think in the second quarter of 2015, they might announce like what's going to come out of it. So people with kind of certain income level and certain level of assets can go invest in startups for equity. Um, and th the whole idea behind Jobs Act was kind of put startups back on the scene and kind of you know bring them up. So that would actually be very exciting uh, for us. Oh, by the way, there's a picture of the Google grant uh, that we had applied to. We actually found out we unfortunately did not get it, uh, but only like seven teams out of 200 something got it across the world. So I'm not too surprised. Uh, but yes, yeah, so this was kind of their uh, proposal, and I'll like transition to my research and um, my contribution to the work. Um, their research focused on what was called open web of things. They wanted to create the whole Internet of Things idea, and they wanted to people to work on protocols. We were one of the only proposals that went in talking about kind of blockchain ideas um, to the, the cloud. Um, and here I'm going to go a little slow because some of you might get a little confusing. But the whole idea behind digital uh, definitive logical access is that you can do a set of things right. And you do them so right that like you can't do them wrong. I know that sounds weird, but I'll explain what that means. You basically, you're, you're taking advantage of properties that are inherent to a data structure. Bitcoin, as a recording tool, does one thing very, very well. It will not let you double spend. And the whole idea is, with double spending, if I have X amount of money, I spend X amount of money. In the time that it's being verified, I can use a specially crafted like, you know, script or code to spend the $100 again because they haven't been verified, so they really haven't been taken out of my account, so to speak. But if I spend them again, so you know, I send them twice, 
hence doubled spending, the blockchain will reject the second transaction because it can figure out that like that it's not working. My proposal was, well, why don't we take advantage of this? Why don't we force a connected device to double spend, which we know is going to get rejected, and we use that as a basis to do yes or no operations. So I'm streaming a video, all right, and I have paper access, um, which is, you know, I pay for, to view for 12 minutes. I'm running the video and like my smart contract says that my money is going to keep going down. When I hit the 12 minutes, the video is going to keep going down, but I only pay for that much. The, my device is going to say, okay, pay for more. Well, I don't have any more money, but we're going to force it to spend the money again. We do that it, because this kind of simplifies the development side of things. So you force it to do that, you know for a fact the blockchain is going to turn into the contract. Because the blockchain can identify the yes or no answers. Like it can tell you, okay, this resource, like this kind of, you already spent the money, you don't have any more resources. So I can't issue you the next 12 minutes or next whatever segment. Uh, we took advantage of that and tried to build an enterprise cloud out there. And I'll walk into, you know, walk you guys through that. So the approach, the kind of process that I really want to you know, get across um, is that the way you do this, this kind of stuff, the way I approached it, was you, f you find problems that have already been solved. And you use them as a basis to make a decision. So going back to the whole idea of the ISA, the instruction set architecture, you can do a few things, but you can do them very, very well, which is add, subtract, divide, XOR, and all those logical gate functions. You can do a very small set of them. I think about 18 of them, but you can do them very, very well. And you know that the answer is always going to be reliable. The problem with the blockchain was that you're afraid that the answer might not be reliable if you use it to do something kind of enterprise grade, right? It might not work out the way you want it to be. So you want to rely on things that you know are going to like kind of work out very well. Double spending we know is going to always give us a no. No matter what question I put, if I double spend in addition to that question, I'm always going to get a no as an answer. So we use that as a basis to build logical operations on top of it. So if I know, I'm always going to get a no. Can I frame the question such that the question is meaningful so that the no answer means something in terms of my application? So we're streaming, am I done yet? No. 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 That doesn't make any sense, right? Because you're, you're, you're going to stream forever. But if you ask the question, is my contract kind of up yet? And then when you, you are done because you're, you're, you know, your, your money that you paid is running out. By the time you hit the end and you start to pay again, which you don't really have the money for, well, you, you can use that to terminate. So basically, you can kind of see an upper hard limit that you can never kind of cross using this idea. And I'll talk about why that kind of matters down the line. Here's the Bitcoin application stack. And in five, 10 years or so, this is kind of going to be what will be happening out of most Bitcoin startup companies. Because the whole idea of a full stack startup is that you don't just build a product, but you build the services around a product that give an experience. The way, of the f way for the future is going to be a concept called experience experience economies where people are actually paying for the experience so um, there's, an, uh, there's an app called Gympact anybody here use it no okay so uh, it kind of recently came out and they got funding from um, Healthbox this is a startup accelerator here the idea is they're not doing anything new what they're basically doing is creating these kind of gym <coughs> places they're called studios you can just go there with friends and you have a mobile app that kind of links all of you in one pack and you go there and you scan your thing and it lets you in and you can do whatever you want there. so nobody tells you what you need to do but basically the idea is they're capitalizing on the fact that you can have that experience all four of you from different places or whatever go to the same place and have fun they're, that's what they're capitalizing on and that's kind of where the American Bitcoin is heading too so let me walk you guys kind of bottom up um, initially we have the shared data uh, that's kind of very very fundamental um, access where everyone downloads the blockchain. On top of it is the blockchain itself, right? So the blockchain uses that data in a kind of logical manner, connecting one event to another, a picture I presented earlier on. After that, on top of it is what's called the overlay network. That's kind of the network of nodes. So publicly verification and all those that kind of go to the next level. That's the shared data protocol. So this is the, the layer that shares all the data across all those computers that are connected to the blockchain. The next, the second kind of component is the shared protocol layer. The protocol layer actually is what allows rules to get passed down. 
So the whole idea of double spending, always giving me no answer, is a rule that I can almost always certainly believe in. So passing that on to low-level applications is going to be sort of separate from the, uh, from the data layer which connects the blockchain together. On top of are individual decentralized protocols. This could be any cryptocurrency. So I kind of put them as you know kind of in one group, but it could really be, be anything there. On the next layer, and that's kind of where we're getting the, the, some of the most exciting things happening. Uh, the storage that I, uh, the company that I presented earlier on, are creating a commercial API to kind of do street, excuse me, streaming and hosting using the blockchain. You can kind of see going up the, the ladder, you're reaching already the shared protocol layer where it's commercial APIs. The last layer that's going to come out very, very soon is actually being able to do operations on the blockchain. So if you use like, um, it, am, the Amazon released that thing, it's called the do button or the dash button, you just press it, you can order one thing. And you can keep ordering it again and again and again. So th the idea basically is you, you reduce one function to just kind of pressing a button, right? So soon enough we're gonna see the blockchain, we're gonna see applications created on top of the block, blockchain using four elements. First one is the transactions. Second one is the blocks strung together in, in an order. The third one is data transactions. And last one is the amount, so to speak. It could be token or whatever, but the amount being transferred. So we're gonna see those four components. People are gonna get really kind of creative, combine them in, a, in an interesting manner to make applications on top of it. So you can kind of think about like in-app games, sort of what they did to gaming, blockchain is gonna, or the apps are gonna do to the, block, the Bitcoin blockchain. And by the way, I should really mention here, it's not the Bitcoin blockchain per se at this point. It could be a blockchain because the generalized infrastructure is present across almost every cryptocurrency. Um, I already spoke in brief about some of this, uh, but basically, you know, again, the whole idea behind uh, different logical access is you have certain known fundamental truths. Truth is more philosophical, but really the same idea that you can build something on top of. Right, so, so you know that something is always going to go a certain way and can we take advantage of it and exploit it to build higher level functions. And I'll talk about one of the higher level functions in a moment. Um, probably a more understandable idea is, is the idea of preemption. Uh, and that's when, you know, on the processor chips, a task... So in, in, in preemption what happens is you have a task that's on the run queue. So this is kind of uh, like processes running on the processor itself. So it's on the run queue and it's going to get put on the processor. But the processor determines something else is kind of more important. So I take it off, put it in the wait queue, something else is going to go on the processor. This whole removal of task is called preemption. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. Where the whole, if you go back to the example of streaming, right? So something stops. That, so if one device was streaming for 12 minutes, that device gets taken off. Now another device gets put on there. So imagine someone watching a security videotape or something, and they only need to, to have access to X amount of it. So one, when that part of the thing is done, their device loses access and someone else gets access, which is who's their boss or something like that. Um, so this is kind of, kind of going back to the idea of the Enterprise Cloud. This is part of the proposal I wrote to the, uh, to the NSF to get the, um, the funding. It's, it's through a program called the Young Entrepreneurs and Scholars. And so I'm not going there now, but uh, kind of the whole thing, the, the Enterprise Cloud that we, we propose to create has five components. Yeah, okay. The first one is obviously the server. So you're taking the idea of blockchain running for everybody to close it off and blockchain running just for my organization. Now, now the advantage of this is that the organization has their infrastructure and they can run a kind of a private blockchain, which really was not the initial intended user, right? So Satoshi didn't envision that down the line people would start to use blockchain for assets. He thought that it would really be a way to kind of get across with, uh, with money. But so the first part was servers. So you would have to have your own servers to run it. Uh, storage, obviously, which is the, the blockchain itself acting as a storage, storage component for events. And these are not just events per se, like you're recording the whole thing. But the events are being stored elsewhere. All you're recording is the metadata on top of it, which says X event happened in relation to Y event. It's the whole idea of contextual knowledge, which is really kind of being pushed forward by a lot of um, kind of you know, leaders in, in, in uh, distributed development, which is you don't need information about an event that's happening and the next event that's happening. What you need is the information about how these relate to each other. 
So a thousand events happen, but like, do you really need a thousand events? No, they could probably go store in a database. What you need more importantly right now is how those thousand events relate to figure out what's important. So in context, you can really figure out some things. Uh, so the, the nodes are obviously kind of a few you know, publicly verifiable nodes. I say publicly, but in an organization, they'll have to be private servers that need to be part of that. Um, and so moving on, I don't want to spend like too much time on you know, what we propose, but so I already gave up this, this theory example. And then what is really, uh, really kind of novel about, about this is that we can take advantage of a lot of the features that are present in the blockchain for uh, doing, doing things that are really new in the sense that, so imagine vending machines, right? So you have vending machines all over here. So someone actually has to come by, if I recall, so has to come by and kind of see like how much money this machine you know, kind of got, take it out, refill it, and so on and so forth. Imagine kind of a peer-to-peer -peer pay, pay network that can use vending machines to get kind of property level access. So this machine only has access to this area for X number of time. When that runs out, that machine needs to kind of pay to kind of be rented to rent the place there. So you're talking about now the implementation of smart contracts with logical operation where I mean, you can kind of, this is the, at the most basic level, this is the idea of taking Ethereum's Turing completeness and breaking it down into problems that are already on the blockchain. <coughs> so instead of me trying to say, okay, well, Ethereum did this, let me like make another language that lives on the blockchain, I, I try to think more fundamentally, can we do something that is already present on the blockchain and build logical operations on top of it? Right, so, so imagine you know, in Ethereum, someone would just use the scripting language and write an application. In our framework, you don't need a scripting language. All you're gonna actually end up doing is framing your problem, in, you know, framing your whole idea in sequence of problems to all of which the answer is no until you reach the stage where no is the right answer. Um, I think I talked about most of this. I apologize, the last one cut off, but I already mentioned that the streaming stops when the contract is nullified. So, um, the idea um, here is that with definitive logical access, what you can do, and we're trying to do, like, this is kind of the next step where I'm taking my work to, is, is sort of property and resource allocation. Where can we definitively know that like this prop, this asset can be allocated to this entity for X amount of time? And so you can kind of do autonomous uh, property allocation and then terminate the contract, like all automatically. So there's no need for a person to do this. Um, and this could apply to cable, you know, your streaming uh, devices. This could apply. This could apply to vending machines, which is kind of an interesting example because I saw so many of them. Actually, honestly, I would like use this just because I don't have to carry cash on me. I'd be pretty near here. Um, so what did I learn? There was a lot that went down in the project. I spent, I was, I was working on this kind of really putting the proposal together. I was here about 55, 60 hours a week. And so it was kind of, kind of tough, but um, yeah, this project is hard to do. Logical, logical access to blockchain is really hard to do. So I commend the Ethereum folks for really creating something so powerful that allows you for a lot more than just logical level access. So they do a lot more than what I propose with this. Um, next thing I really kind of want to get across is things like Docker. Uh, enterprise cloud deployment software is really, really hot. Get on top of it. Five years down the line, you're going to get really ahead of the curve if you learn those technologies. Um, and another thing I learned, which is, I guess, kind of obvious in retrospect, is um, blockchain is amazing for recording events. It can do that. I mean, if we really pushed it to its limits, and we really saw just how amazing it got. Like, I could do the whole streaming example on my phone, and, I, and you know, in the kind of demo we did, and it was really amazing. Like, the blockchain could record events, especially the, what I mentioned earlier, which is relationally. So it could record contextual information in, in an absolutely phenomenal manner. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>